Sometimes the things that affect you the most as a child are the things you become most passionate about as an adult. For me, it's education. I was doomed to fail from the start. You see, when my mother was pregnant, she suffered a series of complications. And the doctors told her that there was only a 50% chance that I was going to make it. And if I did, I'd probably be brain damaged and wouldn't achieve much in life. The best thing that she could do was take me home and just to love me. True to the doctor's predictions, I was slow to walk, slow to talk, and slow to learn. I struggled to maintain a C average in primary school and high school, and I scraped into university with the lowest grades permissible. So given this fantastic track record, how do you think I was going to do it at uni? Well, I ended up with a PhD in cognitive science, the scientific study of how the mind works. I ended up with a university medal for outstanding academic achievement, and I ended up with a GPA that put me at the top 1% of the student population. So from a C average brain damaged student in high school to the top 1% overnight. So what was the secret? Well, the secret is I am nobody special, and I hope to thoroughly convince you of that by the end of this talk. <laughs> Instead, I stumbled across some fundamental truths about learning. Some basic principles, if applied to the education system, would change millions of lives. And it comes down to basic neuroscience. The truth is, we're all fantastic learners, and we all have an innate thirst for knowledge. From infancy, nobody teaches us how to crawl or grasp objects or to walk. We learn such things through self-directed exploration and play. Interestingly, the highest concentration of, of the brain's endorphin receptors are actually found in the learning centers of the brain. We're actually hardwired to learn and to find great joy in learning. But if this is the case, why is it that so many kids struggle at school? And the answer is that there's a mismatch between how we teach and how the brain naturally learns. Now, if we look at the learning centers of the brain, they release endorphins with an inverted U-shape with respect to familiarity. So things that are too familiar are boring. Things that are too unfamiliar are aversive. But things on the periphery of our knowledge that extend our capabilities are actually highly pleasurable. Not only are endorphins released, making learning enjoyable, but dopamine is also released, making learning highly addictive. So who's checked Facebook today? So, if everybody wrote the same things every single day on Facebook, it would be too boring, it'd be too familiar and you wouldn't do it. If it was written in some sort of foreign language that you didn't understand, it'd be too unfamiliar and you wouldn't do it. Facebook is pleasurable and addictive because you're always getting new information on the periphery of your knowledge. You're always learning. And it's this natural thirst for knowledge, which is how kids naturally learn and how competencies naturally emerge. Take, for instance, how kids learn to physically interact with their worlds. Uh, a few years ago, I, I ran some experiments using robots to actually test some of these theories. And what we did, we gave these robots basic vision and hearing and basic reflexes like a baby. But we also gave these robots happiness. So that is the preference for exploring on the periphery of knowledge. And what happened, like a baby, their initial explorations were completely random. But over time, what this was actually teaching them, that random activity doesn't really do that much. And once it learnt that, it got bored of it and actually stopped behaving randomly. But there were some cases where interesting things actually would happen, particularly when you put your hand in front of your face. You'd see this white blob. So over time, instead of acting randomly, it started learning hand-eye coordination. And this is basically what children do as well. But again, over time, this became boring and it stopped doing it. Very similar to how a child splashes in the bath. We don't do that because we know what it actually does and it gets boring, right? <laughs> but over time, again, there were some interesting things that was happening when it put its hand in front of its face, particularly when there was an object present. So when there was a hanging object, if you hit it, it would swing. If you hit a button, music would play. In this case, Dora the Explorer, which is very fascinating to kids. And if you turned around and bit on a chew toy, it would activate the sensors in your mouth. So over time, this robot learned to master its environment. None of this was pre-programmed. It learned through happiness. 
in the same way that a child learns, finding joy in self-exploration and play. So we are all hardwired to find learning incredibly pleasurable. So none of us, if given the choice, would stare blankly at a, at a wall. What we'd rather do is engage in activities such as reading or checking, checking Facebook or watching YouTube or even going to TED. Right? So things that, that actually activate the learning centers of the brain. So if this is the case again, why is it that some students don't do well at school? Well, let's fill a classroom with 30 students and see what happens. So we have a teacher up the front teaching a set curriculum to a set pace. Unfortunately, every student is different. So some students are going to be ahead and bored. Others behind, finding le learning particularly aversive. Very few students are actually getting the information on the periphery of their knowledge that's required for optimal learning and pleasure. And as a result of this, millions of children are getting left behind. One study of North, in North America actually showed that 63% of the student population are disengaged. Right? And this is not a fault of the student, this is a fault of the system. So thinking about, back about my own learning journey, it actually makes a lot of sense. In primary and high school, I was just one of the 63% bored out of my mind. I was sitting there just waiting for the day to end. But at home was a different matter. See, at home I had freedom to actually explore things, and I had quite a natural interest in computers. So the, the age of 10, I started teaching myself how to code. I would read every book there was and taught myself nearly every language that there was. And by the time I hit university, I was an expert. My wife prefers to, to use the term geek, but <laughs> she's not here, so I'll pretend the correct terminology is expert. So what happened when I got to university? Why did I suddenly do well? Because I had freedom of choice. There were things that I was interested in, which was all the geeky things like cognitive neuroscience, philosophy, and I could choose those subjects. And I, as a result, I loved going to class, and I did well. Unfortunately, most students are not given this opportunity. And as a result, are stuck in a system that diminishes rather than inspires them. Sir Ken Robinson has said on various TED Talks that the education system doesn't need to be reformed. It needs to be transformed. We need less standardization and more personalization. But the real question is how? So given that teaching already ranks as one of the top 10 most stressful occupations, how is it possible that a teacher could do even more work and personalize the learning journey for every student in the class? It seems an impossible task until now. So I believe the answer to the future lies in technology, and in particular, my own area of research, which is artificial intelligence. So AI can now be viewed as an intelligent tutor that will sit over your shoulder and give you personalized education. And what I'd like to do is give you some very practical examples of this. And I'd like to demo my own software that, that I'm currently working on. Uh, and I'd like to talk about three levels of AI, the different complexity and how they'll be used. So the first level is around rote learning. And this is the boring stuff we all have to do, right? So what is five times seven? What's the capital of France? What's the French word for happy? Name this bone. But it's applicable to a whole wide range of tasks. So how do students usually learn this? Well, we give them an exam. And if they're a good student, they'll probably cram for it. But if you cram for an exam, there's actually an exponential forgetting curve. So most of what you've actually learned is forgotten in the next few days. And as a result, the kids haven't actually learned all that much. The best way to write learn information is what's called spaced repetition. So you actually refresh the information just when it's about to be forgotten. And every time you do this, that forgetting curve gets less steep and you actually remember more over time. Interestingly, some studies have shown that with exactly the same amount of study time, you can double your performance just by switching to spaced repetition. The other question is how to study, so what to do. If you're rote learning, a lot of students just grab their textbook and highlight and read and reread until they feel that they know it. Unfortunately, according to the science again, this is a really horrible way of doing things. The best way to rote learn information is through what's called active recall. So that's actually testing yourself, like for example using flashcards. So what is the capital of France? And when you do this, you remember a lot more. 
So given a classroom of 30, 30 students, to actually optimize rote learning, what I need to do is know exactly what every single student in that class knows or doesn't know and present exactly the right material at the, exactly the right time for optimized performance. And this is impossible for a teacher, but actually quite trivial using technology. So this is my own sort of system that allows any, any teacher to actually create their own tutorials, upload it to the web, and share it worldwide. And what we can do is create lesson plans. Teachers can use a simple drag and drop interface for embedding things like uh, YouTube videos, animations for teaching the material. But then we have these uh, flashcards. And flashcards can do anything such as teaching, uh, you know, having quizzes such as what, what's the capital of Victoria. We can use AI to do character recognition, so draw the Japanese symbol for five, and even audio recognition, so play a middle C. All the student has to do is log into the system and choose a topic on which to work. And the system takes care of the rest. The system actually generates the forgetting curve for every piece of information, presenting exactly what the student needs to know at exactly that point for optimal learning and retention. And of course, being a computer system, you can gamify it in whatever way to make it more fun for kids. So that's rote learning. That's a good start. But we want to do better than that. We actually want to get into active learning. So teaching things like problem solving and creativity. And this is where generative AI, level two, comes in. And generative AI can actually create its own questions for the child to answer. So for example, in teaching music, what generative AI can do is not only listen to the student and provide feedback, but can actually generate its own music matched to the skill level of the student. So it knows what the student can and can't do and actually generates the right music for that student. And again, this is applicable to a whole range of, of topics from uh, touch typing through to mathematics. It's about generating the right problems for that student at that point in time. And this we, we can do with, with today's technology. So how would we use this in the classroom? So first of all, we get rid of boring lectures and textbooks. And we replace this with personalized AI-enabled e-learning platforms that really optimize the learning process. And this will teach the, the children what they need to know. But then the, the role of the teacher becomes more exciting. It's around teaching the, the kids why is this information important? Why do we need to learn all this math stuff? What are the cool things that we can do once we know this information? So it's around creating personalized group projects that the kids uh, can work on that actually uh, link the information to things that they actually care about. And again, we can use technology, social networking, for sharing these ideas across the globe. So you know, a single teacher does not have to do all the work. So again, this is stuff that we can do now with today's technology. So the next level is level three, which is really what's coming up in the future. And this is integrative AI, where we actually match generative AI, which is the ability to create its own questions, with various technologies. So for example, in teaching a, a child a foreign language, we can use virtual reality and embed the, the child in particular contexts and, and really interesting scenarios that teach that uh, subject in the shortest amount of time. And we can link this to other existing technologies such as gesture recognition. So you know, the Xbox at the moment has this wonderful system where it can actually detect movement and your gestures. We can link this to generative AI so it can teach things such as dance, uh, martial arts, even sign language. So the point is we can use AI for generating exactly what the student needs to learn at that point in time for optimal learning. So AI is here, we can use it now, but it is, I guess, expanding and improving at an exponential rate. There is a tsunami of change about to hit our shore, which I believe will totally transform the way we approach education. And if we do this right, we'll enable every child to unlock their hidden potential and to live a full, rich and valued life. But there are some things we all can do in the meantime. There was a quote I found on the internet, which uh, sometimes people say, so Socrates actually said, but he never did. Um, but it's a really nice quote. And what it says is, education is the kindling of a flame, not the filling of a vessel. What every child needs is someone to delight in them, 
someone to help them find their natural joy and curiosity, someone to help them explore at their own pace topics that fascinate them, someone to help kindle the flame. Be that someone. Thank you.